a sweater. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Afia, and we are back with Python round two. I guess we are done with attendance, and I'm moving first. Uh, today, we are going to look at some of the basic Python libraries, including one library that we use for machine learning models. And uh, we are going to use the pre-written COLA files for today's lecture, and those can be found here. I am sending the link on Zoom chat. So uh, I request you to download the whole repository. You can just download the zip. like this. And extract the files. So if we go inside the folder, uh, we will see these directories the folder where we have all the codes, Python codes, and we will see one folder named data. Inside that, I have a comma separated value CSV file. It's similar to the Excel file that we use. Uh, we are going to need this file to understand one library. That's why we need to download the zip folder. So you can download the zip folder from this link. And once everything is downloaded, you can go back to the link, open the code repository, and open the file python libraries underscore one. So uh, when we say library, what do we visualize? A place where we have a collection of books. Uh, if I need any particular book, I need to go to that library and then I can select the book that I want. Uh, the word library in Python is very similar to the physical libraries that we know. So here, instead of... So instead of books in Python library, we have blocks of pre-written codes that the developers wrote for us. Whenever I need to use some function, I just need to call that function from the Python library. Just like I go to a physical library and I find the book that I need, I need to import a Python library in my code and after importing, I can use any of the modules, any of the functions that has been written inside that library. So it actually makes um, our life a lot easier. We will see examples of four basic Python libraries today. We will start with NumPy. Uh, the word NumPy is like the short form of numerical Python, as the name suggests. We use these to work with uh, different kind of arrays and metrics and various numerical operations. That's a third party library, but it's very popular because it will make things a lot easier. Uh, we will see one example 
why we are going to use NumPy instead of basic Python lists, lists or basic data structures. Then we will look at the Pandas library. This library is very famous for data analysis. So for example, we have a very large Excel file and we need to read that from Python. We need to pre-process the data set. Most of the data set that we use are actually collected from sensors or maybe some devices. And sometimes we have missing data. We have um, polluted data or maybe uh, data that are not actually uh, properly normalized. So we have to pre-process the whole data set. And Pandas library is very helpful in these kind of tasks. We are going to see some examples. Then we will look at Matplotlib and Seaborn. Um, either one is actually good. Both of them are for data visualization. So when you want to draw any graph, chart, bar, or anything, we can use these libraries. Seaborn is like an upgraded version of Matplotlib. So if uh, I would suggest that learn Seaborn because it will cover everything that Matplotlib offers. And also we can start from Matplotlib too. And after that, we will look at some basics of neural network and uh, Python scalars library to deploy machine learning model. That's the, like the second half of the lecture. So I'm going to start with NumPy. So let's go to the Colab file, Python libraries one. And as I said, I need to go to a library and then I can find the book. So instead of going to a library, I need to import the library in my code, then I can use its functionalities. So the first line should be import the library NumPy, and I'm going to use a short name as NP. Now, NumPy is actually famous for its address, so I'm going to use a NumPy array. We have seen tuples and lists in our previous lecture. For example, this is a tuple. Tuple is a collection of data that, and we write it using the first brackets. And Using this line, we are actually converting this tuple to a NumPy array. So NumPy convert this tuple to an array. The command for this is numpy.array and use a tuple inside. And now it will be converted to an array. Similarly, we can convert a list to an array using the same function, numpy.array. And then these are like some examples how we can define arrays uh, we can define arrays from a tuple, we can define array from a list, we can define array in other ways. For example, if you write this, numpy.arrange 1 to 10, that means we'll have an array that will have the values 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Um, so these are like, and if we write numpy.zeros n, it will create an array with n number of zeros. So these are like different types of uh, different methods that we can use to create arrays. Now, the very first question that I asked myself, why am I going to use this array thing to create a data structure when I have list? They are doing the same kind of things. They are actually not doing the same kind of things. Let's look at one example. Say I have a list. And I want to multiply each of these elements by with two and print it. So what I can, I want to do something like this. What would Python do? I am trying to multiply all my elements and print it. Let's see what happens. No, uh, I wanted something else. I didn't want this. So it just prints my whole list twice. It doesn't multiply each of the elements, right? How can I do this? With a list to do this, I need to use a for loop. Using a loop, I need to iterate over the list. I need to access all of the elements one by one. I need to multiply them, then I need to print them. That's like three lines of course. But using NumPy array, that's actually one line of code. So I need to import the NumPy library. Let's convert the list to a NumPy array. So my array is 
in p dot array i need to convert my list to an array now if i do the same thing print my array let's see what happens now everything is multiplied by two and printed and like this is the kind of functionality so the, the whole for loop is actually implemented in numpy star operator so when i am using this um this is what i wanted we we could do this with a list but it would take three lines this is just one simple example how numpy has made our life easier there are a lot more similar examples and for example we can have a very long array and maybe we want to just look at a portion of the array um, so in that case we need to use the indexing and slicing functionalities from numpy library for example uh, i have to define this thing first so in the first cell i have defined some basic arrays for example we can use multiple dimensional arrays we can use 2d array which is very similar to an excel table we have rows and columns we can define 3d arrays like x y and z and we can define 4d 5d things that i can't even visualize but we can do that. For example, I can define create a numpy n dimensional array in the array with shape two, three. That means we will have two rows and three columns. I haven't given any values in my uh, rows and columns, so there will be garbage values. And this is the array. All these are garbage values. But yeah, I have two rows row number one, row number two, and I have three columns one, two, and three. I can also initiate a multidimensional array with uh, values, for example, here. This is my row number one, row number two, and row number three. In e each of the rows, we have four columns, column number one, two, three, four. So if I print this array, this is the array that I have, three column, three rows and four columns. We can also define 3D, 4D, and n-dimensional arrays. And let's look at my array one. What was my array one? This thing. One, two, three, four, five. And if I write just print array one, two, so that will take the third ele element from my array. Zero, one, two. What's the third ele element of my array one? One, two, three. So it will print three. It will print three. Now let's see uh, again. Say my array one is equal to this, and I want to print a portion of my array. So what if I do this? So it will start from index two and it will stop right before index four. So it will print three and four, three and four. So this is how we slice an array. We take a portion from the array. So this is the start index and this is right before we stop. We can also uh, slice 2D arrays. For example, say what's my array 2D? This one. So I'm defining a 2D array with three rows and four columns. Now say I want to read only the first column. What does that mean? First print my array. So this is my error. And I just want to read the first column, not other, other things. So I just want to read one, two, one, this thing. That means I want to read all the rows and only the first column. 
how can I do this? Print from my array. I have to read all the rows. I can define this by this, read all the rows. And which column do I want to read? Only the first column. So the zeroth column. If I write this, so anything before this comma is how many rows do I want to read? And anything after this comma is which column or how many columns I am trying to read. If I write this, it will read all the rows and only the zeroth column. That means one, two, and minus one. What if I want to read this portion? Sorry, I can't. Like the first two rows and first two columns. So I need to read two rows and two columns. So I can just like, so I need to read row number zero and row number one. So that's zero to two. I will stop right before two. And for the column, same. I need to read column number zero and column number one. So I'll stop right before two. And it will give me the first two rows and first two columns. So yeah, that's how array slicing and indexing work. And we can also print my array shape and we can also reshape the array. And there are a lot of other functionalities in a NumPy documentation. Whatever we need, we just need to search the documentation. Here are some other examples. Uh, I'm just moving first because we don't have that much time. And just one more example. Uh, if we remember in the last class, we actually tried to sort an array and we had to like write a really long code for that using swap and do those things. The, we use the bubble sort algorithm, but with NumPy, we don't actually need to write the very long code to sort an array. I can just call numpy.sort method and it will sort my array. So this is how life becomes easier. Now let's look at the pandas library. So this is how uh, we can, this is one of the methods we can use to upload files to Google Colab. So we just importing some Google Colab library and we are using this to upload my file. I can choose the file. I have a sample file here, I'm choosing that. The file is uploaded to Google Colab server. Now to read the file, I can use the pandas library. So I have to import the library and I can use the read CSV file, uh, read CSV function. If I run this cell. So I'm going to read the file and now I'm going to read the first few entries from the file. So this is how my file looks. Sorry, this is how my file looks. So I, I have some employee ID. I have their name, age, uh, their job ID, their salary, and their bonus. So what Pandas did for me, it actually read the CSV file and it actually is showing me the file. Now I can like modify the entries um, I can pre-process the data set. I can do whatever I want with this data and I can also save that in the same file or maybe in another file. And I can visualize the file. For example, here I have some histogram and this may look very complex, but I just need one simple function, um, pandas hist function. If I call that function, it will draw the histograms for me. I don't need to do anything. Um, so these are some more examples, but uh, we actually don't use pandas to visualize data because pandas is not for visualizing, it's basically for analyzing data. For example, if we have null values in my data set, that's a very common problem. We can use the replace function from pandas uh, and all the null values will be replaced by zero or something that I want. And sometimes we have missing data. For example, we have data for five minutes, then two, for two minutes, my sensor is not working, we don't have data. Then again, we have data. So we have to interpolate the missing data. Again, we have pandas.interpolate function for that. So this is actually uh, basically for pre-processing and analyzing data. For viewing data, we use matplotlib or Seaborn. 
for example, this is an example. Uh, I can just plot anything with matplotlib. I'm saying during the x-axis, use the time steps. And along the y-axis, use these values. And it will plot the values. And similar thing we can do using Seaborn. Seaborn will override the matplotlib's um, basic functions. If we just do this, we have to import Seaborn and then we have to set it so that we can overwrite matplotlib's default parameter. And if we draw the same graph now, it will look a bit more fascinating, that's it. But sometimes Seaborn offer like really easy ways to do things, especially when we are working with Pandas data frame, we can directly use the data frame uh, to plot graphs using Seaborn. And sometimes Seaborn is really easier. And in matplotlib, we have to use like, we have to write like seven or eight line codes, but with Seaborn, we can do this with one line. So here are some examples how we can use Seaborn. And Seaborn has some predefined data set that we can use to, as, as a beginner, we can use this data set and to see, see like what happens. For example, if I run this line, I have to import Seaborn. And I have to import Matplotlib. So these are the basic data sets that Seaborn has defined. For example, if we use the Titanic data set, it has a list of all the passengers um, in the Titanic ship with their age, gender, and some other things. If we look at the iris data set, it is a data set of iris flowers, three types of flowers. And there are different data sets. I don't actually know all of them. Let's look at the iris data set. So I have to load the data set. This is the function to load data set from SNS Seaborn library. And this is what my iris data set looks like. So if we look at iris flowers, just for reference. So this is a data set of this flower. This is not an image data set, it's a text data set. So it looks like this. So that means if I have sepal length 5.1, petal length 1.4 and this, then this is an iris flower of the species setosa. So we have data of three different species, Setosa, Virginica, and one more, I don't remember the name. And we have total 150 instances of data. So we can use this data set to see how we can use Seaborn to visualize things from this data set. And here are a lot of codes I actually tried. For example, let's see this. I want to draw a box plot with my x-axis as the species column from the iris data set and my y-axis, yeah, for my y-axis, we are going to read the sepal width column. What is my species column? This column. So this will go along my x-axis and my y-axis should be this one. If I want to draw a block, box plot, so this is my box plot. So I don't need to like define the colors and anything. Python will take care of everything. But if I want, I can also use a customized color. Uh, there are parameters for those. And there are like other options in Seaborn. I'm just going to skip those. Here are examples. And I would suggest whenever learning a library, just go to the documentation page and see what happens with all the functions. And for me, I am too lazy to go to the through the whole documentation page. Whenever I need something, I just Google that. Someone has already posted that on Stack Overflow. I just copy their code. Uh, yes, here are some other examples. I have never drawn a pie chart in uh, Seaborn. I just did this for this course. I usually use um, Excel for this. That's easier. I guess we are done with the basic libraries. Like this is the most uh, weakest version. This is the weakest version I could do because I have to go to the neural network thing. So um, it's really hard to describe a neural network um, within this short period of time, but I will try. Uh, neural network or, or AI and machine learning is the new hype thing, but 
it, it took me like a lot of time to actually understand what do we mean by the word artificial intelligence? How machines can have brains? Like, like I was thinking maybe they design some kind of brain, brain. they like 3D print our brain or maybe inject it via something or, or like that. I was really confused. And what's the difference between regular programming and artificial intelligence? I mean, this thing also looks like very intelligent to me. I'm just saying do a box plot and it's plotting a box plot for me. Why is not this one is an intelligent model? For example, all the examples that we have seen till this now, none of these are intelligent. They are doing a lot many intelligent things, but they are not intelligent. Why? Just look at one example. Say I'm saying uh, sum is equal to two plus two. And I'm going to say print two plus two is equal to sum plus one. Yeah, this is why this program is not intelligent. If I tell it, write two plus two is equal to five, it will do that. If I do any kind of mistake, it will just follow me. It doesn't have the basic intelligence, the learning capability, it, 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 it has nothing. I have to instruct everything to the machine, then it will just follow my instructions and it will write whatever I said. So uh, that's why it, sound, it looks very intelligent, but it's not. it doesn't possess any kind of intelligence. So how can we like inject intelligence into machines? To answer this question, um, I would say everything in science and technology is actually inspired from nature. So we have to first understand how do we learn? We start learning from our childhood. So how do kids learn? For example, this boy, he will look at this image and he will say, oh, this is a bird. This one is also a bird. This thing is flying, so this is also a bird. Whenever we are we are learn something in uh, our early age, we do mistakes, and then what happens? We have someone, maybe our parents or teachers. They would like rectify us. They would say, "Hey, that's not a bird. It's a butterfly. I know it's also flying. It has wings, and it's very similar, but they are totally different." So we have like three steps in the whole learning process. First, we try to learn the things, and we try to learn, we try to predict uh, using our brain. Sometimes we are right, for example, in these cases. Sometimes we are not right, for example, in this butterfly case. When we are not right, we get feedback from our parents. So we have to try things, we have to get feedbacks. Based on that feedback, something happens inside my brain and I get to learn that, okay, even though they look very similar to me, they are actually different. These two are birds, and this one is a butterfly. So using that feedback, I somehow update my knowledge. So these are the like three basic steps of learning something. I have to try. I have to get a feedback. Based on the feedback, I have to update myself. How can I incorporate these three things inside a machine? so that it tries to learn things, it gets the feedback, and based on the feedback, it updates itself. How do we learn? Okay, um, what do we have inside our brain? I, I, I'm not good at biology, but I just know the basic. We have a lot of neurons that are connected to each other. Whenever a data is passed through the neurons, they, the data is somehow processed, and at the end, we retrieve the information from the data. That's like the most, that's like my highest level of knowledge uh, regarding our brain. And that's what I actually need for neural network. We are going to deploy the same architecture inside a machine. So we are going to have multiple neurons stacked in different layers. We are going to connect them just like neurons inside our brains are connected to each other. And some kind of magic will happen inside. That's something we are not going to learn today. And we actually don't need to learn because we have Python. 
And because of this magic, any kind of data that passes through the network, we can retrieve the information from the data. For example, uh, I, I have to train the model in some manner that whenever it sees this image, it says, oh, I know that's a bird. Whenever it sees this image, it will say, I know that's a butterfly. To do that, I need to somehow train the model. How can I train a model? How did I train the kid? I had three steps. The, the, the child tried to learn, he got a feedback. Based on the feedback, he updated himself. I have to implement the three steps in this model too. So at the very beginning, it has to try to learn. It has to see an image. It has to take the image in the input. It has to, it has to pass the input through all the layers. At the end, be it wrong, be it right, it has to predict something. Say it looks at the image and it predicts, oh, I know this is an aeroplane. That's okay, it's predicting wrong, but it's at least predicting. So I am done with my first step. Now I need some feedback from my parent. If I assume this neural network is the kid, I need a parent. And in terms of machine learning, the parent is called the loss function. So we get our feedback from a loss function. What is a loss function? This is the difference between my predicted value and the original value. So looking at this image, my model said, oh, I know that's an aer aeroplane. And that's not an aeroplane airplane, that's a bird. So there is a difference between the original value and the predicted value. That means there is a loss. And because of this difference, the loss function will increase and it will send the feedback to the model. Hey, you are predicting this wrong. This, is, this should be a bird. This is not a plane. Then the model will get the feedback and it will update itself. How will it update itself? We need some kind of magic for that. How do we update ourselves? Our brain is uh, like function for that. God has made our brain like that. So here I need, like, we need to be the God. We need to do something so that it can update itself. And for that, uh, we have a very beautiful thing in mathematics that called optimization. Loss function is a function. And for any function, we can find its minima or its maxima. Our goal is to find the minima of the loss function. In mathematics, there are ways that explains how can we find the minima of a function. For example, gradient descent is a very popular way to find the minimum value of a function. So we need an, to the update mechanism that happens inside our brain in terms of machine learning, we call that optimization. So we have the three steps. My, my model will look at some image and it will try to learn, it will try to predict. Whenever it does something wrong, it will get feedback from the loss function. Based on the feedback, it will update itself. And for it to update itself, it needs some kind of optimization function, for example, gradient descent. There are other optimization functions too. So that means without knowing anything about the mathematics behind the neural network, we can deploy a neural network if we can define a, an architecture like this, if we have data set that this can use to predict things, if we have a loss function that can give us some feedback, and if we have an optimizer that does all the magical things. Now let's, let's assume we don't have any Python library. In that case, we have to do this every little things by ourselves. We have to define all the nodes, we have to connect them, we have to initialize the parameters, we have to initialize the loss function, like, the, like everything. That would be a really huge task and nobody will be interested in machine learning. Thankfully, we have Python. And let's go to the... Let's go to the GitHub thing. Uh... I'm going to the GitHub library again. And let's open Python libraries too. So we are going to use one Python library 
to do the whole thing that I have described right now. And we can use the Keras library. I have found, like, like according to my suggestion, this is the simplest machine learning library and the beginner friendly one. We also have PyTorch, but that seems a bit complicated to me. So I, we will start with Keras. So these are the basic libraries that we need to use. And these are the Keras libraries that we need to use to define the whole machine learning model. So we first import everything. Now, to do the machine learning thing, we need a data set, right? So that it can learn. And we have just seen the IDIS data set, so I'm just going to load that one. So in the data set, we have three different species of flowers, Setosa, Virginica, and Versicolor. So I have loaded the data set. Now, I need to pre-process the data. What do I mean by pre-processing? If we look at the data set, uh, the final column that I'm going to predict. So I'm my machine learning model is going to take these values as its input. And looking at these values, it will predict if this is a Setosa, if this is a Virginica, or, it, or otherwise if this is a Versicola or something. So how can, so these are my input features. I have four input features, one, two, three, four. And my output should be either Setosa or Virginica or Versicola. Now, Setosa, Virginica, Versicola, this doesn't make any sense. I have to convert them to something numerical so that my, my model can work because everything happening inside my neural network is pure math. And I cannot use like English language to do pure math. So I have to convert the strings to numbers. So I'm going to replace Setosa by the value zero. I'm going to replace Versicola by the value one. And instead of Virginica, I'm going to replace by two. I can use like it differently. I can use Versicola as zero, that's okay. But we have to start from zero because there's some other function that I'm going to use later. And for that, I have to start from zero. So now everything is replaced and now my dataset looks like this. So instead of those English words, now I have zero one things so that everything is pure mathematic. And now I have to define what are my inputs and what is my output. What are my inputs? Everything here. What are my outputs? Only the last column. So if I take the species column from my data frame, that's my output. So take the species column from your data frame as your output. I'm defining my output by Y. And what is my input? Remove the last column from your data frame. Everything else is my input. So I'm going to drop the last column and everything else is my input. And right now, what we have is two data frames. I have to convert them to NumPy arrays because machine learning, Keras's machine learning models use NumPy array. They don't work with data frame. So I have to convert X to NumPy. I have to convert Y to NumPy. Now I have two different arrays. This is my input array, this is my output array. And finally, I have to do one last thing. I have to convert Y to categorical values. What does this mean? So there's a funny thing. This machine learning model is really dumb. When I say that I have three classes, zero, one, and two, it assume I have three classes, zero, one, and two. Two is higher than one, and one is higher than zero. So these classes have some kind of relationship between them. This is not true. These are three independent variables. None of them depends on each other. But if they have some kind of relationship between them, my model will not work properly. It will somehow learn the relationship between zero, one, and two. This is not true. They are not related. So I have to define the classes in some way so that my model cannot assume that they have some kind of relationship. To do this, 
instead of using 0, 1, 2 to define three classes, I have to use this kind of notation. For now, Zetosa is 0. I don't remember the name. This is one. So I have to, instead of this notation, I have to do this. If I do this, there's nothing to compare. If I tell you are zero, you are one, you are two, there's by default comparison between these three. But if I say um, you are the, like for if I belong to class Setosa, then this bit is on, the other two bits are off. If I am from class Varsicolor, then this bit is on, the other two bits are off. There's nothing to compare. No one is actually higher or lower than other one. So instead of using 0, 1, 2, I have to use these vectors. And I don't need to like manually convert these things. I have a function that scares us to categorical. So I have to convert the 0, 1, 2 to categorical values. Let's run this term. What happened? Yeah, I didn't do this. So now everything is converted. And I have to do one more thing. I have this huge data set. I have to split this. A portion of this will be used for training my model and another portion will be used for testing. So it's like, first we get trained and then we have to sit for exam. So I have to divide the data set. I keep the large portion for training and a small portion for testing. So say I'm trying to split it by 80% and 20%, 80% for training. So this is the way, there are a lot of different ways of splitting. There's also um, a built-in function in the scikit-learn library, I didn't use that one, that use one line to split the training and testing data. I have done this manually. So just run this. Now we had 150 instances of data. Now we have divided this 120 for training and 30 for testing. And now we are going to start building the machine learning model. First, we have to define the architecture. What architecture? This architecture. We have to define how many neurons we have, how many layers we have, and how are they connected. There's a question in the chat. Um, do, do we do that or... I, I can look at this. Is there an easier way to do that instead of having the answers? Yeah, I don't know. Hi, Joel. Uh, I, I don't think I actually understood your question because when I converted these to the vectors, I just used one simple line. And I guess that's the easiest way to do it. Like I didn't do it manually, but you have to convert these to categorical values. You're welcome. I have a question. How should we decide what proportion of our data set should be specified to training set and uh, you you should do it by trial and error, but um, usually that's another thing called validation. The conventional method is um, we keep at least 60% for training and rest of them either for validation and testing. So now we have to define the model. So this is the function or method that I use to define my model. So I am taking a sequential model. That's an API from Keras library. If you look this, so I imported actually this library. So I'm just saying that I'm gonna take a sequential model. What's a sequential model? That's just a stack of layers one after another. 
then I need to add my layers. For example, in this image, how many layers do I have? One, two, three, and four. This is my input layer. This is my output layer. And everything inside is my hidden layer. So let's say I am also trying to do some kind of similar thing. So I have to, in Keras, I can have dense layer and there are other options. For this example, I'm using dense layers. Dense means all the nodes are connected to all other nodes. For example, this image is an example of dense layer. This yellow node, node is connected to all the nodes here. Everyone is connected to everyone in the next layer. This is called dense. And there are other options. For example, they are not connected to everyone. And they're like different versions of neural network. This is the simplest version where everyone is dense. So I'm going to add a dense layer with 20 nodes. In this example, how many nodes do I have? One, two, three, four. But for this example, I'm just taking 20. You can take whatever you want. You can make it 10, five, or whatever you want. It doesn't actually matter. And this is a like trial and error approach where people actually try with different structures to find out which suits the data set best. So it actually varies from data set to data set. So for example, I took 20, 20 neurons. And since this is my first hidden layer, I have to define what is my input dimension. So this is my input dimension. It comes as a parameter and then I just used it. And what is the activation thing? This is one of those voodoo magic that happens inside. Uh, I didn't talk about the activation function. I talk about the optimizer function. This is something that provides nonlinearity to my neural network because uh, our data set are actually nonlinear and we have to like make the whole system nonlinear. Otherwise it wouldn't be able to track the real data set or real scenario. And that's why when a, whatever happens in every uh, layers, I have to define some kind of activation functions that provides some kind of nonlinearity. So ReLU is one of the activation functions that is used mostly for the hidden layers. There are some other functions, just Google activation functions in Keras. You will have a list and you will also have a list here. Yeah. I couldn't hear you except the word sigmoid. No, there are some uh, some some rules. You can use some kind of trial and errors, but not all the activation functions are appropriate for all the scenarios. For example, in the last layer, I used softmax. Why? Because in the last layer, I want to have some probabilistic value that should be something between zero and one. Now, softmax is an activation function that outputs the value that's between zero and one. Not all the activation function does that. So in the last layer, I have to use some activation functions that will always provide something between zero and one. It can be softmax, it can be some other things that always that's always between zero and one. That can be a factor of tri like trial and error, but you cannot use some random activation function that can output minus one because no probability can be minus one. There is a scope for trial and error, but it's not like a vast scope. You can use all the activation functions. So uh, there are like some kind of differences between them. And the most common practice is use ReLU in the hidden layers and in the output layers, use softmax because softmax converts everything to a probabilistic value. So I, so I add the dense layers and finally I add the output layer according to my output dimension. And for this layer, I'm using softmax because I need the values between zero and one and in a way that sums up to one. Only softmax does this so that I can have probabilities. Why do I need probabilities? Um, if I look at this structure, I have only one node in my output layer. So I can have at most two classes in this system. It can say zero or one. What happens if I have multiple classes, more than two classes? For example, in this case, I have three classes, Cetosa, Virginica, and Versicolor. So I should have like multiple nodes for that case. For three classes, I should have three nodes at my output layer. 
each of the node will predict the probability of being that class. So this node will predict the probability of being Setosa. My second node will predict the probability of being Varsicolor. Third node will predict the probability of being Virginica. And which probability is the best, like is the highest? That's my predicted class. So that's why it should be a probability. Otherwise, there wouldn't be any correlation between the data set, between the outputs. And now that the model is defined, so I have kind of defined the basic structure, this thing. I still have to define my loss function and my optimizer function. That means how do we optimize the loss function? To do this, we have to use the Keras's compile function. So I'm saying use the category. And I can also define an optimizer here, like this. If I don't define anything, that's also okay. Keras has some default optimizer, it will just be here. And Keras has different kind of losses. When we have multiple classes, categorical cross entropy is the loss that we want. We also have binary cross entropy that we use for two classes. We also have like mean square error that we use for regression problems. So we have a list of losses. And if we look at the documentation, they actually say which loss is best for your task. So I'm just going to compile this. Now let's see how many features do we have and how many classes do we have? How many features do we have? One, two, three, four. If we look at the data set, feature number one, two, three, four. So this should be my input shape. And how, what should be my output shape? We have three classes, Setosa, Virginica, Versicola. So my output shape would be three. And now I'm going to create the model using input shape and output shape. This function will be activated and it will create the model and it will return the model. I can just print the model summary. Remember we had 20, 15, 10, and what's my output dimension? Three. So 20, 15, 10, and three. This is the number of parameters explaining this. Uh, I can explain that also. For example, I have 20 nodes in my first hidden layer. How many nodes do I have in my input layer? Four, because I have four features. So every node is connected to everyone. So four into 20, that's 80 parameters I have. How many parameters do I have here? Three into four, 12. These are the parameters, one, two, three, four four for this and four for this. 12 plus one, two, three, four. Why plus? Because the magic inside the neural network is this value is multiplied by some weight that's here. Then it's gonna add it with a bias that lives inside here. For example, say so this is two and the weight is 0.5. It should be two into 0.5 plus the bias value that's here. So how many parameters do I have for these two layers, three into four, 12, plus one, two, three, four, four, 12 plus four, 16. Now look at this, four into 20, 80, plus 20. So I have 100 parameters. Similar to the second layer, we have 20 to 15, 15 into 20, 300, plus we have 15 passes, 315. So this is our, we don't actually need to know that, it's just the basic. Now we need to train the model. So we need to pass the training data set. That's my training input, training output. If I run this, it will learn the, the whole model will run for 50 epochs. That means the whole training data set will pass for 50 times through the whole network and it will update itself for 50, actually more than 50 times. It depends on your batch size. So for now, let's assume it will update itself for 50 times. It will get feedback and it will update itself. And batch size is how many data set are passing through the model at once. What does it mean? Just let me explain within one minute. Say I, say I got acceptance letter from three universities and I want to decide which one should I select. I am a very, very confused person. So I asked my mother, which one should I select? I asked my father, which one should I select? I asked my teacher, I asked my friend and everyone. That means I take feedback from a lot of people before taking a decision. 
this thing is happening here. My model takes feedback from 20 data set before updating itself. If I write one here, it will take feedback from one data and it will update itself. That's not a very clever thing. Just take feedback from some random people and update yourself. He might be wrong. So the best practice is using this mini batch thing where you use 20 or 50 or 64 samples to take one decision. So, okay, my model is trained and Keras took care of everything. It ran for 50 epochs. And after 50 epochs, my accuracy is 91. What was my previous accuracy? It started with 31. So remember the kid, he, he was saying that's a bird. He looked at a butterfly and he was saying that's a bird. He was making mistakes. And because of the mistakes, his loss was so high and his accuracy was so low. But as time passes by, his accuracy increases and his loss decreases. And after 50 times, like 50 feedbacks from his parents, his accuracy becomes 91%. That's a lot. Finally, remember we had the test data set separate. We have to evaluate my model on the test data set. And on the test data set, my accuracy is something around 96%. That's good. And I can just draw a graph. So this is the curve of my training accuracy. At the beginning, my model was not accurate enough, but as it started learning, it got very accurate. Yeah, this is the end of Keras library. I have just one more file for PyTorch library that I'm not gonna show today because that's a bit too much, but that's another machine learning library that we can use. I solved the same problem using PyTorch library here. If you're interested, just look at it. And I will just conclude with a very interesting fact. There are a lot of works in the area of machine learning and AI. Still, nobody actually knows what happens inside a neural network. We can define uh, how the model is going to learn things. We can define the loss function, we can define the optimizer, we can define the network, everything. But we cannot define what happens inside a model. What happens inside a model, that's solely its own. And that's the beauty of artificial intelligence that after a certain level, you don't have any control over this algorithm. I, yeah, I guess that's the end of this lecture. Thank you.